this morning, I would like to welcome Greg Warnick back. Greg has been gone for almost five months, and Shelly has, has remained strong, uh, but we've all been praying, and let's welcome Greg back. We're so glad you're back from Afghanistan. Well, two weeks ago, we set the table for a new series that we're going to spend the balance of the spring on, on a series on our value, Dying to Self. And dying to self is one of our values, but is it something that we easily embrace? Is it something we get excited about? Well, it's been said that if you don't operationalize your values, then they're just mere sentiments. If we don't take steps and, and, and actively try to put them into motion, then it's, it's just a warm fuzzy. And so as we begin this series on dying to self, I'm going to try something a little bit different. Uh, we have some of these old cards. They're, they're little memory verse cards that are right up here. There's uh, 100 on, on this side, 100 on this side, and 100 in the back. Um, so if, if you'd like to, over the next few weeks as we go through this, um, we're going to have a, a different memory verse for every week. And I just encourage you, um, the, Larissa and Adrian made them small enough. You can stick them in your wallet or into your pocket or your backpack. And as you have a few moments, as you're waiting for your parents to come pick you up or uh, have a few moments before a meeting, pull these out. And, and I, I'm a firm believer that if we're spending time in God's Word, that's going to begin to change us and transform us. So I encourage you to do that, and if you would like to, send me an email, and we can challenge each other every time we see each other. Hey, what's Ephesians 4.24? And, and so we can uh, practice memorizing these scriptures that will help us to remember the, our call to die to self. But you know, it, it sounds good to live as Christ and to die as gain, but are we ready to do that? Is that something that we want to do? It, I heard the story about a little boy that was overheard praying this, Lord, if you can make me a better boy, don't do it. I'm having a really good time like I am. Isn't that us? There's a reason we're the way we are. Because we arrange our life in such a way that it seems to suit us. In a way that pleases us. If we're honest, we struggle with the concept of dying to self and trust in God to lead our lives. Because a lot of times, we'd rather go it alone. I know for me, when I was living up in Connecticut and had an apartment to myself, it was just a one-bedroom place, I got to control, control things exactly like I wanted to. No roommates. I just said, this is the way I'm going to live. And so I had to outfit it, and I had one twin mattress back in the bedroom. But the living room, all I had was just a single recliner. And it was great. That's all I needed. And it was faced right towards the television. And so I could just kind of prop down here. I didn't need seating for other people because I wasn't going to invite anyone over. This was my own little world. Now, as, as far as food, um, it's hard to cook for one. At least that's how I, I rationalize things. So I ate on, on takeout pizza and just kind of uh, whatever I was hungry for, I chose to go do it. And if I needed to make a run for the border at midnight, I hopped in the car and I went. Well, television, of course, I got to watch whatever I wanted to watch because I was the only one there, and it was pure greatness. I, I, I never lost a remote. Amazing. I, I knew exactly where it was. I had it in a little compartment right next there to my recliner. And it, if I wanted to stay up to 2 in the morning watching an Indiana Jones marathon, I could do that. And then I could follow that up by playing Donkey Kong till the sun came up in the morning on Nintendo pure greatness and sleep all day on Saturday if I chose to do that. Now, as far as schedule, well, I could fill out my day timer anytime I wanted, in any way I wanted to. I could come and go as I pleased. Didn't have to check in with anyone. It was wonderful. I could go out with whoever I wanted to, hang out, do whatever. Chores, well, if I wasn't feeling the urge to go do laundry, I would just go buy more underwear. It was great finances that was the best part about being single well I, I was working for an advertising firm and they weren't paying me a tremendous amount but I had never had so much disposable income at, either before or after as during those days when I was a single person supporting myself 
And so I had all this extra money. Did I support kids in Africa? No, I went to the store and I bought high-end Nakamichi uh, stereo equipment. I spent $1,500 just on components. Guy at the store said, well, you really can't appreciate them unless you buy some speakers. I spent $2,000 on speakers. And this is late 80s, early 90s. A lot of money. And they sound wonderful. Jill calls them my caskets. She says she's going to bury me in one of them. And I'm like, I don't think I'll fit. She goes, we'll make it work. I told the kids, there's two of them. All right. But I controlled my life. I set up life like I wanted, and I loved it. And it it was wonderful, and it was all about me. Well, I'm not picking on single folks, because we need single folks within our congregation, and this church is not just about mom, dad, and the kids. But whether you're single, married, divorced, whether you're in high school or whether you're retired, this is something we wrestle with. We wrestle with who is the locus of control? Who is the center? Who is the one that, that's guiding your life? Is it you or is it God? Because we struggle. We want to be in the driver's seat, don't we? We do. And it's hard for us not to be self-centered and to put that aside to be God-centered or other centered So it's something we have to wrestle with. As disciples of Jesus Christ, we know, as Todd mentioned, we're called to to deny ourselves, to take up our cross, and to follow Jesus. This week, newly elected Pope Francis I said this about discipleship. When we walk without the cross, when we preach about Christ without the cross, we are not disciples of the Lord. It, it's just sentiments. It's something that we, we say is wonderful. But unless we're willing to follow after Christ and take up our cross, it's not discipleship. We can say that we believe these things, but unless we're truly willing to allow God to direct our lives, it's not discipleship. Okay? Well, uh, how, how do we start this process of dying? I mean, where, where, where do you even begin? Hold on. We'll get there. Weeks to come. But until we answer the question of why, it'll never have the motivation to help us answer the question of what or how we we go about this process because the how has no motivation. Well, in, in order for us to begin to live differently, we have to acknowledge two things that, that are doing badly, that, that are going to provide resistance to a change. Because all of us, whether it looks like this or not, we all want to be in control. And so we we have to realize there are two things that are doing battle. One is by our nature, we're selfish beings. The Bible talks about from, the psalmist talks about from birth, that that life is about us. And that's something we have to battle. And the second thing is, as was mentioned earlier, we have a resistance to change. We're not sure that we want to be transformed, even if it means being transformed into the image of Christ. So in order to begin to live differently, we have to create what's called a burning platform. I don't know if some of you business guys have heard that, because it's an idiom that means that sometimes there has to be dire circumstances that are necessary to bring about a radical change. And if, if, if you're not in, in, in such a, a dire circumstance, then you're going to say, okay, that's great, but I'm not going to make those changes. Well, the origin of the term came from a story about a young man that was on an oil platform by himself. And, and late at night, he's there in the North Sea, there's a big explosion. And he wakes up, and he quickly sees there's flames all around him, and so he puts on his clothes, he scrambles through the chaos, and he goes to the edge of the platform. Now, he's got all the, the flames behind him, so he has to make a decision. Am I going to jump 100 feet into the frigid temperatures down below in the North Sea? And, and if the fall doesn't get him, well, then hypothermia is quickly going to set in if he's not rescued. But the only other option is to be engulfed by the flames. So, of course, the man quickly makes that decision, jumps, and fortunately is rescued. But the point of the story is that sometimes it takes a platform ablaze to bring about major change in behavior. Survival instincts will kick in 
and, and trump our comfort zone instincts that, that are very strong. So the balance of, uh, of our time this morning, what I would like to do is set our living for self platforms ablaze with three matches. The passage that, that Lincoln read was the calling of Matthew, Matthew chapter 9. You can flip over there if you'd like to. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 9. And what's going on with Matthew is the decision for him to become a tax collector was no small decision. If he is uh, like other young men, he spent the majority of his life studying the law. In fact, all of the young Jewish men were required to memorize the Pentateuch, the first five books that were written by Moses. And also, there was plenty of learning and and sitting at the feet of, of teachers that would tell you not only about what God's plan is for your life, but how to live that out. And so you you would study under these these people. He also had to be well-versed in the politics of the day to see what was happening in his village and among the people he cared about, brothers and sisters living under the oppressive hand of the Romans occupying their country. But at some point, Matthew takes all of this that he's been taught about that his parents and grandparents and those in the village have shared with him and says, this is valuable. This is how our family defines how we're going to live. And this is how we're going to be as a people. He has to take all of this and say, I'm going to give that up to become a tax collector. At some point, he had to defy his upbringing to begin a life of rebellion to everything that he had been taught to take this job. Well, the Jewish tax collectors were a despised lot and considered to be dishonest traitors. Uh, Some even employed enforcers. That if your family hadn't paid up on taxes, they would send out a a Jewish guido type to go and and, and break your leg or or to to imprison a family member until your family got caught up on their, their tax burden. It was totally despicable. To be in this line of work, Matthew was openly living into defiance to everything that he had been taught. And he was putting self over his parents, putting self over his family and friends, and self over God. Where does this lifestyle lead for Matthew? Where would it lead for us if we continue on in this rebellion? Well, let me strike the first match. Match number one is living for self leads to loneliness. The gospel records that the Jews sometimes grouped tax collectors in with sinners. And they were were kind of put in the same lot as swindlers, as cheats, as crooks, as adulterers, as prostitutes, and worst of all, as Gentiles. People that couldn't be associated with, people that couldn't be talked with, people that you had to keep your distance from. He went from being inside the people of God to being outcasts in order to take this position. Tax collectors were not allowed to serve as witnesses in court. They would never show up on on jury duty because people considered that that, that they were dishonest and everything they said was a lie. These tax collectors were not allowed to go into synagogue because if they went in there, which synagogue was everything to these people, they would defy the very house of God. The Mishnah also says they weren't allowed to come into the private homes so you have this collection of, of sacred laws that even talks about how you interact with tax collectors. And so if they entered into a Jewish home, it would become defiled. That's how much they despise tax collectors. And so for Matthew to give up everything in order to receive this, he was living an open defiance. And living his life for himself meant that Matthew no longer could, could be with his family, his friends, and the, vill- the villagers he had known all his life. You cannot pursue a life with God and life as the world defines it. You know, in in Paul's final letter, he talks about and and gives the sad news about a young man named Demas that had traveled around with him on their missionary journeys. In in fact, he was mentioned in the book of, of Colossians. And here's what he said about this young man that walked away from his faith. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 10 says, Demas because he loved this world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. We don't know what happened, but he was right there on the front lines. He was going out and and serving with Paul, 
putting his life on the line and doing all these things, hearing the gospel being preached, seeing the power of God. Yet there was something that he says, I'm going to exchange all that to go after what the world says is important. And he walked away. We don't know if it's out of fear or have jealousy. We simply do not know. You know, it used to be in the church that disfellowship uh, would come for people that were, were living in open rebellion to sin. Nowadays, more times, people disfellowship themselves because they can no longer reconcile the, the world that, that, that uh, the church holds up with the life that, that they're currently living. Early on in my ministry career, one of the youth deacons at our church left his wife and, and two sons to run off with, with a, a woman. And I was able to connect up with him. About a year later, his divorce had, had just become final. And I asked him, will you please come in? Because we, we were close. I said, let's at least meet for lunch. So we started talking. And I asked him, I said, I, I know that you miss being with the boys and having them under the same roof and I, you know, being somewhat disconnected. I said, what, what do you miss most beside that? He said, hands down, what I miss is communion. He said, I miss taking the bread and the wine, brothers and sisters within that fellowship, and us having Christ in common. He said, I I haven't darkened the door of a church in over a year. He said, that's what I miss most, my time of communion. In Psalms 38, David describes the effects of sin. He said he, he felt as if God were pressing down upon his body, and so he has this anxiety, and it just something within him doesn't feel right. He was living for himself and not for God. And when that happens, it leaves us lonely and longing. God puts it within our heart that we're dissatisfied if we're not living for him. Match number two I like to strike is living for self leads, leads to emptiness. Undoubtedly because of his position. Matthew was a wealthy guy. Tax collecting was a lucrative venture. It also led to, the second thing, he had job security because he would actually buy into a franchise that would allow him to have control over a region and pull in a great amount of stuff. So he didn't have to worry about losing his job because no matter what the economy was doing, he was always going to be able to collect taxes from those around him. But he was also socially connected. I, I know I just said he was lonely, but he was connected to another group of people. His large home was a perfect spot for big banquets and and parties like like we see listed here in Matthew chapter 9. But who was he meeting with? Well, he was meeting with fellow tax collectors. He's also meeting with other sinners. And Matthew had a crowd to run with. So he had all these different things. But yet, there was something that was missing and he was not satisfied. Online blogger Rachel Held Evans released her top 100 Kim Kardashian tweets from 2012. If you have no idea who Kim Kardashian is or what a tweet is, ask your kids or grandkids. But anyway, from her tweets, as you can imagine, this socialite slash reality TV star is pretty self-absorbed. And so here here are some of her tweets. The first is, it's New Year's Eve. She, She tries to be pretty profound. It's all about drama and fun. Unfortunately, imagination is precisely what the petite bourgeois mentality lacks. You know, all the small people, you know, you you just don't have the same thing I do. The second one, what's up, NYC? I'm so excited to see you this weekend, even though everything which occupies you interests me only slightly. Isn't that great? The, The next one, to win a crowd is no art. For that, only untruth, nonsense, and some knowledge of the human passions are needed. Like me on Facebook and learn more. But, you know, even though she has it all in, by the world standards, looks and fame and wealth, in her tweets, as I started reading some more of these, she can't help but reveal some of the hollowness of the self-absorbed life. Next one is, it's not too late to buy my true reflection fragrance. It gives spiritless sufferers the smell of artificial vitality. Next one, I I love facial treatments. While one's immortal soul is disintegrating, they make you feel rejuvenated and refreshed. I am weak, melancholy, soul sick, profoundly a failure in many ways, but I'm down six pounds. Yay, best feeling. After my death, it is my favorite. 
After my death, no one will find among my papers a single explanation as to what really filled my life. Sour cream and onion potato chips. And the last one, from lashes to blushes, makeup plays a huge role in all of our lives. By changing us outwardly, it helps us to forget who we really are inwardly. You know, we were made to crave God. We were made to follow in his, in, in his footsteps and to become like Jesus' son. And, and there's a void that no, matter, no amount of money or, or fame or self-promotion or, or anything in earthly relationships can fill. And so when we try to suppress that, that craving by pursuing pleasures, it, it just comes up empty, doesn't it? We've all been there. And so we try to, to run after various distractions and pursue different things, but ultimately God is saying, no, come drink from my well. Come experience the true life that you were planned for. And before Matthew experienced Jesus, though he had it all, there was something empty on the inside. Well, the third match that I would like to light on the platform of self-absorption is living for self leads to death. You know, if we continue suppressing to promote self, ultimately it's going to lead to our demise. We, we know that, don't we? Proverbs 16, verse 25 says, there's a way that seems right to man, but in the end it leads to death. So we, we have this understanding that the God has laid out. This is how life is supposed to be. This is what you should value. This is what I'm, I'm calling us to, to be part of a rich fellowship that's following after me. But if, if we take that and exchange it, there's something that's going to be missing. And ultimately, it's going to lead to our death. And it leads to, we're just a shell of who God intended us to be. And we don't want to do it. And so when, when we choose not to do it, we're living in defiance. Well, I, I don't want to leave the impression that just living in sin it is what I'm talking about. That, that it's just between right and wrong. Sometimes we can do the right things, listen to this church, but fail to build a loving relationship with God. This is one of the scariest passages in all of Scripture. It's Matthew 7 and verse 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, or enter the kingdom of heaven but only he who does the will of my Father who's in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, uh, didn't we prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles that I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. This is scary to me. These people are trying to do what's right. And they're running with a crowd that's doing things right. They're even being empowered by the Spirit to accomplish kingdom objectives. These are the folks that are here every Sunday. But there's something missing. They're going with the flow. Because Jesus talks about the wheat and the tares are in the same field together. It is not until the time of judgment that if we haven't cultivated a relationship with God, not just done godly things. If we don't have that relationship, if we haven't sacrificed the life that we've built, the life that God's calling us to, He said it leads to death. Though I was in Connecticut planning a church, I, not God, was at the center of my life. I was controlling everything that was going on. And on, on my own, I was doing things my way and here's the thing, looking back, that I regret. I relished in the undisciplined life. Being undisciplined with my time, undisciplined with, with my money, un undisciplined with the opportunities that God put before me because I could sprinkle in a little God and, and feel good about what I was doing. A, a boy from Texas going up to, to help plant a church. Man, God could have done so much more in my life if I had submitted myself to Him. Well, let me give you just a little bit of hope for this morning. You know, in spite of all my selfishness, God kept pursuing me. In spite of all of His baggage, He kept pursuing Matthew as well. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 9, as Jesus went on from there, He saw a man named Matthew sitting at a tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. 
Matthew got up and followed him. You know, for Matthew, his entire life changed. You know, unlike Peter, if the whole deal with Jesus didn't work out, he'd go back and and you saw that he did some time, that the fishermen went back and started fishing again. For him to give up this job and his franchise, he was giving up everything. And God honored that. He gave him a new life, a new group of people to run with, people that, that, were, that were disciples like him of Jesus Christ. He took the pen that he had used. I imagine it's the same one that's in my mind that he used to use on the tax code. He took that with him and took parchment and wrote down the actions and the words of Jesus to pass on that story. Rumor has it, or tradition has it, that Matthew was martyred in Ethiopia. But that's when his body was killed. Matthew died that day. And God began a new work within him. And that's what he's calling each of us to. That same invitation, come and follow me, is offered to us this morning. You know, we know that life without him leads to loneliness and emptiness and ultimately to death. Jesus bids us to die. Jesus bids us to die the kind of life and come and to live a new life but, but unlike the analogy of the burning platform where it's just kind of lesser of two evils, Jesus says, come to my life. And it's, it's not a life of wanting. He said, I've come that you may have life and life to the fullest. Boy, Todd White is, is spot on. That w- we want to have the benefits of this new life, but still hold on. And, and he says, no, you've, you've got to jump. You've got to jump from that platform. Because the platform of being in, in both worlds is ablaze. And it leads to death and destruction. This morning, the Lord is bidding you to come. You know, he says, I, I want you to come and I'm, I want you to have this kind of life. So this morning, we're, we're offering an invitation. If you'd like to begin this walk today, or if you have begun that walk, but you're taking some steps backward, and you would like to walk differently, We're inviting you to come. We're inviting you to the life that Jesus Christ promised. Life in him. Life eternal. Come now as we stand and as we sing.